Hello. I'm so excited to, to be here to present for you all today. I'm Marcy Sutton. As Laura mentioned, I'm going to do a live coding talk today on some technical accessibility tips. We're not going to cover everything because it is a pretty broad subject, uh, but we're going to look at a React application that I built uh, with some intentional accessibility fails in it, and then we will go through those in code and fix them today. So with that, I'm going to show you what we are going to be playing with today. I've got a little component library here. It's up in the browser. It has a few little components in it, uh, including a login form, pretty standard. And then this little card flip, uh, it's got an animation when I hover over it, which that word hover should make your spidey senses go up that that might not work for a keyboard user. Uh, my two little friends here are Rainier McChatterton and Bagley Fluffpants, my dog that m hopefully won't bark in the background. <laughs> the cat is snoozing away, so I think she won't cause us any problems. Um, so let's go find out what we can learn about this, um, this project I've got here. So it's a component library that in the real world, you'd probably have more components than just two. You may or may not have written it in a JavaScript framework, um, but the accessibility issues that we uncover are common no matter how you've built your project. Some things apply to static websites like forms. Some things apply more directly to JavaScript delivered applications that are written in React or Angular, Ember, runs the whole gamut. So I'll try and point out those things as we go through these accessibility issues. So you know, you know, what are the basics that apply beyond JavaScript applications and which things are specific to JavaScript or React. So I've got this web page. Um, the first thing that I would do is just go into the developer tools and run the Axe extension. So I'm actually going to go back to our login form. I'm going to hit Analyze. And I've got some issues already that it's pointed out to me that I can go through and fix, including some missing form labels, uh, we're missing some landmarks. So that's pretty much the first thing that I would do if I encountered a page I needed to test was go find the low hanging fruit, go fix those things, and then step through it in a little more complex workflow. So let's go over to my text editor. And th since this is a live coding talk, the primary resource that you can check out is on GitHub. It is a talk called Empathy Driven Development. Um, and in the README, it has links to the components that we're going to play with today, um, a few resources, including, you know, who are you even building this for? <laughs> if you need some stats to um, help bolster your argument amongst your team members, um, some resources about creating patterns that have probably already been uh, worked out through things like the ARIA Authoring Practices Guide, um, some resources there. And then I touch on some manual testing and some of the tools that are in this application um, in its fixed state. So I'm in Visual Studio Code, that's my text editor, and give you a little tour here in this React application. Everything that we're going to edit lives in the source directory, um, starting with this app.js file. Make this a little bigger. And hide my little Zoom panel. Um, so we looked at the login form first in the Axe extension, and in this React application, the way that all our components come together is with a templating language called JSX. JSX is JavaScript and HTML together, basically. So it's a mix of custom components and actual HTML, and the end result is that it renders to actual HTML that then you would be able to inspect in the browser and all that good stuff. So if you see things that aren't familiar, like a router in a tag um, or a nav link, those are React components. And they render, in the nav links case, that will render to an actual anchor tag. So on our little components list, we've got our login form. And then my router is doing the work of actually linking that, uh, that login form link in the list to its actual view that contains that login form content. So if we go to the login form, it is a little individual snippet that we're including with React, um, a sort of analogy for a project that isn't built with React is maybe you're in PHP and you've got includes, uh, so you could do it with server-side technologies, um, lots of different ways we've built web applications with pieces of your code broken up. In React apps, it just happens to be the component model. 
So our login form, we we saw already that it's missing labels um, and it was missing some landmarks as well. So those are the first things that we're gonna go in here and fix. So in our login form, I'm just gonna, let's just go fix this. I'm gonna write a label element because we've got an input here and it's got a placeholder, but placeholder is not enough for a screen reader user to know what that input is actually for. So there's a lot of debate around placeholder and whether that should be exposed as part of the accessible name of an element, but it is not standard and not well supported. So we need an actual label here. So I'm gonna use React's dynamic, uh, we're iterating over an array of fields here. Um, so I'm just gonna go grab that name um, property off of this so that rather than having markup all written out for each one of our fields, instead we're doing it dynamically here using some JavaScript. So I've got a label element wrapping our input that actually exposes a label. Since our placeholder is redundant here, it's, it would have the same text as the label, I'm just getting rid of the placeholder because it's not really serving any purpose here once we've added a visual label. So that fixes that first item. And you might even go one step further here and in React, we're gonna add a, an explicit pairing between our label and our input. And in React, um, because it's written with JavaScript, this JSX templating, the for attribute that you would write in your raw HTML in React land that is actually uh, called HTML4. And I'm gonna put to an ID here. Um, let's see, let's do input. Well, actually to save time, I'm gonna skip that right now. Um, but just let me point out that you might have an easier time for cross browser support if you add an actual HTML4 here, and it would point to the ID of this input. Um, so that's how you would pair those together. I'm just gonna not do that right now. Um, so the gotcha there is the HTML4 versus the for attribute. So we've got a label here. Um, I'm gonna go one step further and say that because we have groups of fields here, there's another semantic HTML element that we could use here to better expose the structure of our form. And that is a field set element. So inside of our form tag, I am going to put a field set and I'm gonna wrap it around all of our fields. So we only really have one group here. Um, but by using the field set element, then when we have this H2 for our heading, we can go wrap that in a legend. And that will properly expose what this group of inputs is for. So if we look into field set and legend, if you haven't heard of those before, this is static HTML that you can use no matter what kind of a project you're in. Um, here in our React application, we can just use regular HTML as part of our template. So we've got a little more semantic stuff going on here in our form. Um, we've got a label. I seem to remember Axe was also reporting that we had some missing landmarks. So the app.js is sort of the brains of our React application. It's where everything comes together. Um, so that's really where our landmarks would live. And inspecting this, I can see we kind of have one already. We have a header element, um, but it doesn't have a role of banner, which indicates that this header element is the global header element. Um, we also have a div down here called div class name of main, which um, this class name gets rendered as just class when you're when you get your rendered HTML at the end of this um, process. Just here in JSX, it's class name, but that renders to class. Um, so this div really uh, with the class name of main should probably be a main element. That would be the more semantic choice here rather than a div. Um, and just to really make sure that we're keeping this working fun working correctly in Internet Explorer 11, uh, we have to actually bolt on that role of main and that role of banner. Um, if you're not supporting IE 11, you could possibly skip this, um, but there's still users with disabilities that rely on IE 11 and JAWS or MVDA. Um, and so by bolting on that ARIA role, we're making doubly sure that the, uh, the browser and assistive technology will actually expose what that landmark is for. So if you're not familiar with landmarks, um, they are a way for screen reader users to navigate a page. Uh, they have more than one way to navigate, including headings. So we've got H1 here. Um, they can also navigate by landmarks, and those act as signposts to help 
screen reader user navigate through chunks of content in a page. So these um, global header and main landmarks are typically in like a higher level template, um, something that it's included on every page. In your individual views, like in a login form, maybe you have um, another, like a section or article tags, maybe a, a header inside of one of those articles. Um, so it creates the structure throughout your whole document. Uh, in JavaScript apps in particular, this sort of stuff, it might seem really basic, but it's so often forgotten that that's why I bring it up now is that we have to remember the basics. Uh, they're pretty easy to add, uh, pretty low risk in adding the stuff, and you, you add, in effect, more ways to navigate your application. Okay, so we fixed a couple things. If we go back to the browser now and we run Axe again, our label issues are gone and our uh, landmark issues are gone, which is awesome. So if we go back to the kind of landing page and run it again, all those issues are gone. The login form has some color contrast issues here. The visible labels that we added are just picking up this um, body color of a gray on black and it's pretty hard to see. So we could fix this color contrast issue um, by probably just changing this color to white. Um, another tool I really like using is in the Chrome Developer Tools. If you uh, right click on an element and inspect, um, you could also drill down into the dev tools using keyboard shortcuts. Um, and with that, you can get onto an element and it, over in the styles panel on the right, there's this little color picker. And in newer versions of Chrome, there's actually a color contrast tool in the color picker itself, and it will show you whether your color, foreground color and background color combination will meet uh, the web content accessibility guidelines. There's level AA and AAA. There are different ratios that you have to meet to ensure that your colors are actually, they have high enough contrast. Um, so with this, I can go and pick a different color. I'm actually gonna, so you can see this little contrast ratio line here. If we go above it, our little uh, do not enter signs turn to green check marks. And so we can actually see our ratios um, in this color picker. So that's the quickest way I like to um, go select a color. Um, that's a really fantastic tool that then we can go and plug that into our CSS and then Axe will be happy here. Um, so for easy things like forms, um, you know, lo low hanging fruit in your HTML that gets rendered um, using that browser extension is a great way to go knock out some of those easy issues. Um, we can even go into our, let's go see where that CSS lived. Um, if I go back here, go inspect this. So we've got a label. It is coming from our actual login form. So it's part of the component that um, React is injecting by default our CSS just into the body. So in a real production app, you'd probably want to have a, a more uh, sophisticated CSS strategy, either using a tool like CSS and JS or a, a methodology, I should say. Um, but this, given this is mostly here for accessibility um, basics, we're ignoring that part. Um, so our login form, I don't actually know where that CSS comes from. I think it's coming from our app.js file probably. Oh, here it is, login form, form group. So if I change that to white uh, with the hex value of FFF, go back to Axe. So it has now changed that in our actual source code. I can run Axe again and that color contrast issue is gone. Now, if you're cringing maybe at the field set border here, because I know <laughs> people are very uh, particular about their designs, um, you shouldn't let the default CSS of a field set stop you from using it. You can easily change uh, the style of it and then still get the semantics under the hood. So pretty awesome. So let's move on to our next component, which is the card flip. And this was taken from a real website. Um, it was a conference that I spoke at. They had all of our faces um, up here, and to my knowledge, it probably still works the same way. If you're a keyboard user, you can't actually get to this content. So it's, it was working on a CSS hover only, um, which without uh, some sort of keyboard interactive element like a button, 
Uh, that would probably be the best element to use here, but it was just a series of divs. So if we go inspect this, there is a series of divs here for each team member, uh, which yes, but Rainier and Bagley are part of my team. <laughs> Um, so there's an image here, there's um, an H5 heading, which may or may not be the correct level given our overall content hierarchy. Let's see what else is in here. There's a little Twitter link here on the back side of this little card flip thing. Um, the content sort of repeated from the front to the back. Um, this is taken pretty directly from a real life example. So. There's a number of changes we could make here, but the biggest ones I want to make are to make it keyboard accessible so that if you can't use a mouse or a trackpad, you can get equal access to the backside of this content. So that div needs to become a button. And um, we need to probably change this from a mouse over or hover event to actually persist with a, um, a keyboard click. So I'm gonna make a design decision here that we're gonna change it um, from mouse over and then try to shoehorn in keyboard support. I'm making the, the judgment call that we're gonna make it work on click and, and that will work for both mouse users and keyboard users. From an implementation perspective, it's just easier than trying to like manage the, the state of it while you're hovering. Like if you have one pinned open and you hover over something else, what happens? I'm just simplifying. So. Let's go back to our app. I am going to open the command line here and stash my changes. Um, I actually have some fixes staged here in Git. So I'm gonna go check out, I think it's 303. Oh yeah, all right. So I'm doing some magic here using Git. Um, it is a tool that I have really grown to love. Um, because you can stage changes, you can play with things, um, you can show other people your code. It's awesome. So for our card flip, let's go find that. It is a component. So from our app.js file, we've got a number of components. Our card flip demo um, is, a, is a view that pulls in one or more card flips. So the card flip is the actual component. So if you go look at that, it is a similar to our login form component, um, but this one we're actually using more than one. So changes that I had to make um, were that we saw that series of divs and let's go down here actually, that's the back side of the card. Um, the, the div that we were hovering on wasn't doing us any favors for the keyboard. Um, so rather than try and, as I said, shoehorn in the keyboard support, I changed it to be a button element. That meant to use uh, valid HTML, I had to change that H5 heading to a span um, because you're not supposed to nest um, block elements like that inside of a button. Um, so changing it to a span allows you to still keep the same visual style with CSS, um, but we can have inline elements inside of this button. You wanna be careful how much text you jam into an interactive element, like a button or a link. Uh, because then when a screen reader user lands on that interactive element, it might read out a whole jumble of text, like a whole page of text. Um, so I know it's tempting to want to make larger click targets by wrapping large groups of content. Um, you should try and resist that and, and keep as little text in there as you can when you're grouping multiple elements like that. Um, just be something to be aware of. So we've got our toggle button now. Instead of a hover, we've got an on click. That click event is going to call up to this handle click um, in our React code. And the way React, um, it, the way I'm using it here is working off of the state. So the initial state is that that card is not active and each component has its own state. So the active state of one won't impact the state of the other unless we have some orchestrating code on top of that. I kept things pretty simple and just used React's native set state. You could also use something like Redux here, which is a state management library. Um, I didn't want to overcomplicate this because that's really not what we're here to talk about. We're looking at things like actual keyboard support and something that I um, wanted to make sure this covered, um, which now that this is actually, uh, I've checked out the fixed version, you can see when I hover over this, there's no action. And 
I changed the visual display to give you a little bit of a tip that this is interactive by underlining the text. So now when I tab through here, I can actually reach each of these little card flips. And when I hit the enter key, my focus is sent into the back side of it. So we're doing some focus management here. And in applications or websites that are really heavy on JavaScript, every time you have a new interactive layer like this, you have to manage the user's keyboard focus. So that is something that um, I had to change quite a bit from this initial implementation. So that means I need something focusable on the front, that button. And then on the back side, uh, we have to send focus to something interactive. And here I have a little close button. So going back to our code, that handle click is just toggling the state. And if the state is active, um, because the same function will run no matter if we're um, which state it's in, um, if it's actually active, then we want to send focus to that close button. And in React, they have a great API called create ref. And this concept of refs or references, um, they are markers for elements that you want to keep a hold of. Um, no matter what's happening in, in the rendered um, application, these are little markers that you can use in your JavaScript to send focus to things. And the close button is one such ref. Uh, we're doing this.closeButton.current.focus. So that gets us a, um, an actual HTML element here that we can send focus to. Um, I should say an actual interactive element. So it's a, it's a button element. Um, and then the toggle button that we started from, that initial button that I had to add around um, the card flip, that's also a good ref to have. So that way, when we're on the backside, once we've sent focus to the backside, um, then when we close it, we can send focus back to that initial toggle button. Um, so our close overlay is something that we've bound. We've got this little close button, that little X. Um, it's a pretty standard little icon is just to use an X. So that's got the ref of close button on here. So you just do ref equals. And then in this um, interpolation syntax, which is the curly brackets, you can say this.close button. And that tells React that this is the close button ref. So that way, when we click on it, we can call the close overlay uh, uh, function and, and do that good stuff. Uh, one other thing I'll point out is that the, the X label, like literally the letter X, doesn't really tell a screen reader user what that button does. So you could argue maybe the word close that's visible to everyone might be the best solution. Um, but in Often in the wild, uh, using something like aria label, uh, the aria dash label attribute, you can add a more descriptive thing. So here I said close, and then I'm using the actual name of the overlay, which in this case is Rainier McChetterton, my dog's name. So this will say close Rainier McChetterton. So for each instance of this component, the close button actually has unique text. So that's another item that, in this case, we're using React. Um, but you want unique labels for your interactive items, no matter how you're building a site. This is true for static sites. This is true for things that are heavier on server rendering, um, all kinds of different uh, scenarios where if you have multiple of the same control, like a, a, a row of editable items and they all have an edit button and they all have a delete button, each one of those buttons needs unique text, like edit item one, close item one, close item two, that sort of thing. Um, so we're doing it here for our close button in our component. And that makes it a little more clear. So right now we're looking at the, the back side of that, that card, um, which I'm calling an overlay. And it's got uh, some SVG in there for the little, um, for the Twitter link. Um, that was actually missing a label. So that link didn't have any text on it, even though it had this SVG. Um, because that SVG is purely presentational, I added a few things to it, including a role of presentation. And then I added an ARIA label on the link itself. Um, so the role of presentation is on the SVG. ARIA label of Twitter, um, I put on the actual anchor. And really, you could go one step further and say Rainier McChetterton on Twitter. As we were just talking about unique labels, so this would be more unique. Since there's two of these, uh, the two card flips would both have a link with the text of Twitter, which isn't what we need. We need more specific text. 
Um, one other thing I've added here is the focusable false um, attribute and value on the SVG. And that tells Internet Explorer not to focus on this. <laughs> I don't know why. That is just sort of a gotcha with working with SVG. If you're trying to use it as like a, a, a graphics resource and it's not supposed to be interactive, um, if you see that focusable false, that is for Internet Explorer. Okay, so we've got some better stuff going on here. Um, in, in the spirit of the empathy-driven or <laughs> test-driven development, which is what this is a, the talk of, title of this talk is sort of a play on uh, test-driven development. Um, I've got some tests here. So the card flip, um, I'm a big proponent of um, automated testing. Obviously, I, I work on the Axe Core team, so I believe in that a lot. Um, but in applications, if you can bake um, accessibility into your automated tests, it's so awesome because you're really providing a contract of how your components are supposed to work. So in this component, I have some unit tests. Um, there's unit tests and integration tests. Both are useful. It really depends on what you're trying to accomplish um, and what you're testing. So for the card flip, I have some unit tests for the active state. Um, I found it was actually very difficult to accomplish what I was trying to do in the unit tests um, for keyboard mechanics. So that I actually put in an integration test using Selenium WebDriver. Um, the tooling, I'd say the, the biggest challenge um, with writing automated tests for accessibility is trying to test what an actual user would experience. And in developer tools and headless browsers, sometimes they don't really behave like a real user's experience in regards to, like for keyboard support. I changed that uh, card flip, the front, to a button element. And a button responds to a click and a key down of the enter key and a space bar. Uh, so if I wanted to just say, like throw a keyboard enter event at a, a button or a space event, um, it should really trigger a click event. But in JavaScript test frameworks, those are those connections have not been made. You literally have to um, have your code listen for the key down event. Um, whereas with things like Selenium WebDriver, they have made that work more like a real user's experience. So I'm using Selenium WebDriver, Axe WebDriver JS. Um, we're using the assert library for our assertions. I've got some little test utilities here for outputting Axe results. But the gist here is that you, uh, you need your app or site running on a server somewhere. It can be localhost, so it doesn't need to be actually deployed on the wild. Before each uh, test run, I'm going to set up the Selenium Builder for Chrome. I'm going to tell the driver to go and get this card flip demo page because that gives me a, you know, an integrated web page I can go and test with Selenium. When it's done, I'm going to go and quit so that I get a fresh browser run after each test. Um, it should work with the keyboard. So this test, I'm using um, some ES6, which is uh, the future thinking version of JavaScript. Um, they have this tool called async await. And it's great for Selenium tests because um, you can really reduce um, the amount of chaining that you have to do in your tests. It's just way simpler. Um, it has some downsides in that it's hard, a little harder to debug, um, but easier to write. So I'm telling the Selenium driver to go and find that toggle button. It's got a class of toggle button. I'm sending it the enter key with Selenium. So it's a button element, and I'm sending the enter key to test keyboard support. So a click event is you know, pretty synonymous with a mouse event. I really want to flex the, the accessibility of this component by sending it an enter key and expecting that it will do the same thing that a mouse would do. Um, so this is pretty unique to Selenium, which is why I like this tool. Um, things like um, Enzyme and React test utilities do not do the same thing. Even a tool like Simulant, um, I could not get to function in the same way. So after I've fired that enter key, I'm going to go and find the element, and I expect that it is showing the backside of that card with that close button. I go and get the text of that button, and then I'm checking that Selenium's active element is the same, that the, that the text of that close button and the active element are the same. Um, and that's even another place where having that unique text of close Rainier McCheddarton, um, that unique text would assure that we have the, the correct element. 
So I'm testing focus management here, making sure that our focus is sent to the right place. I also have a test here to run Axe WebDriver JS so I can get even more accessibility help. Um, so if I run this in on the command line, I can say npm run integration. And that will go fire up Selenium, run my Mocha test, and it's got these tests passing now that we've actually made that element into a button. So it should work with the keyboard. It should have no accessibility violations. We've already fixed a few things that our Axe browser extension found. If I hadn't fixed those yet, Axe WebDriver JS would have found them for us. So you can test the same rules in multiple ways. Um, that's how we fixed our card flip. So I'm sure there are questions uh, that we'll get to at the end. I do want to show you one more component. Um, so I'm going to go down here to our command line. Let me get rid of these changes. Um, so I want to show you a little bit about animation. We're going to switch gears here for the last section. I don't actually have a component here yet because we're going to add it right now. Um, you might work with animations. Um, I, there are so many different applications for this. Um, but what ends up happening for users is if there's a lot of fancy animation, like this um, motion on this little card flip, if you have motion sensitivity, vestibular disorder, uh, traumatic brain injury, maybe you've got a wicked hangover, <laughs> there's lots of scenarios where animation can make users sick. And so as developers and designers, we can be a lot more careful and provide safer experiences if we actually make animations toggleable. So we're gonna go add a toggle button. It's gonna go in our app.js file down here at the bottom. And I'm going to make that work in two ways. Um, the first way is it's a toggle button for every browser that will turn off animation globally. And then we're also going to hook into uh, prefers reduce motion on iOS and OS 10, which is a new CSS media query that actually goes into the user's operating system. So on my Mac, I just went to system preferences. I go to accessibility and display. And there's this item here called reduce motion. We're going to go bake that into our application. So to save some time, I'm going to check out the first version of this. Yeah. OK, so we've got a little, we've got some animation here. Um, we need to manage the state through our application. So I opted to, I'm setting the state just like we were setting our active flag for our little card flip in React. Um, our initial state is that animation is enabled. You could deliver that initial state from a user's cookie if you had it stored somewhere on their system. You could have it delivered from a database if you've saved their preference. You can deliver that in more than one way. Um, and then when you click this little button that I've added, so there's a button here now that says turn on animations or turn off animations depending on what state we're in. It fires a click event called handle animation pref. And that animation pref is just toggling the state. It's similar to our little card flip. We're just toggling it each time you click. And by doing it driven with state, it makes it really easy to have your application react to the state if it's you know, changed from some other source. Traditionally, in you know, jQuery, everything was very like click, fire an event, and it was easy to have too much logic baked in your event handling. Whereas with React, um, part of the reason people like it so much is that it has this idea of state that flows through your component tree. So we've got this little toggle button. We can go check it out in the browser. I have it positioned down here at the bottom. Um, it doesn't really do anything yet. It just, you click it and it changes the text inside from turn on to turn off animations. So let's go wire this up. Our next little um, addition to this is that we're actually going to flow this state change through our application using an animation context. Um, in React, uh, refs is one feature of React we talked about earlier. There's another one called context. And I'm using this as a global state provider. It, it listens from this app.js file and checks this animation enabled um, property and flows it into wherever we need it. So the card flip is now listening for this animation change. Um, and wrapped around our, um, our view that it contains each one of those components is a consumer of our animation context. And it will listen for that change in state. And then we can actually toggle based on that. So I'm adding a CSS class here based on the, whether the animation is enabled or not. 
And then in our CSS, which lives card flip CSS, um, we've got our animations down here. Let's see. Animations on is the default. So if animations are on, then I can use transitions. Um, in my CSS. So we're using JavaScript to toggle a CSS class here. If this animations on class is not here, these transitions will not be applied. So the easing in between, you know, the start state and the end state, it'll just jump between. So it, it, if you get dizzy based on fancy animations, you can just kill the transitions based on that user preference. So now if we go back to our little project here, um, I've got animations turned on by default. So if I turn those off, it just goes like a, a, not even a fade, it just like changes from the start state to the end state. Um, and that really gives more power to the user so they can decide, um, are they feeling sick that day or they have a disability that really makes it difficult to use the web. And that, so that's specific to this one application. Um, you might even put all preferences that, um, that the user can configure in the application itself into like an accessibility page and maybe that's where that lives. Lots of different ways to configure that. Um, but if a user has a disability and they, they have emotion sensitivity all the time, you'd think they'd want to apply that preference across the web. So we can take this one step further and use um, prefers reduce motion. So we've got, um, that setting I showed you in the system preferences. So now in addition to our little app specific toggle, I've got a media query here at the bottom of our CSS that says at media screen and prefers reduced motion. This will match in supported um, environments like iOS Safari and OS 10 Safari. So when the user has selected that reduce motion preference, we're saying turn off transitions for everybody. Um, and we could even go one step further here. If I go back to our app CSS, we could hide that, uh, that animation preference button. If they've selected reduce motion, then that toggle preference won't do anything. Um, so just hide the button for everyone. So if we go back to our little application, um, we've got our little animation set by default. And now if I go over to my system preferences and I select reduce motion, oh, I need to be in Safari, first of all. So it's a good, le good lesson um, that you need to be in Safari for this to actually work. Um, so yeah, I've toggled that setting and now there's no, there's no button and there's no animation. But the, the wow factor here, ooh, <laughs> reduce motion, you can see it actually change the state of your application to hide that turn off animations button. So I think that is super cool. Uh, if more sites and more CSS, you know, starts to use this, um, we should, that would be awesome because it would work for users across the web. Um, we should also be asking more browsers to implement this. Um, like if Chrome could add it, then that would work for both browsers. Um, we would, we need it in Edge and Firefox and all these places that um, animation could be harming people but we can be smarter about how we apply animation. All right, so I'm sure we have lots of questions um, and we, you know, quite frankly, can't do it all in 45 minutes. Um, so I'm sure there's lots more that we could talk about. Um, I didn't actually get to one little part about um, a library I'm using here called What Input, and that um, just suppresses the focus style for um, mouse users. And there's a little bit of debate around, around that, um, but speaking from experience, um, from people who hide the focus outline for everyone, having tools like What Input or Focus Visible, which is a CSS selector being proposed, um, those are awesome tools because it prevents developers from turning off outline none for absolutely everyone when mouse users are really, most mouse users do not want that focus outline. So if you go through the, um, the code, on GitHub, you can go and see what input in there. It's really, I mean, there's not really much to see other than the, the CSS. You just, I can show you. It's just add a, a little bit of CSS um, and then hide the outline only if that mouse condition matches on focus. 
Um, you can even ideally that if you use something like focus visible in the future, that's the standards based solution for this. Um, hopefully we could hook that into something like this reduced motion setting, but for focus, that, that's the end goal of tools like that is give the power to the user so that they can decide. Um, so there's probably more to come on that in the future. Um, but as for our application, we went through focus management. We looked at forms, landmarks, uh, and making things keyboard interactive, baking that into our tests. There's so much um, accessibility awesomeness that you can bake into your projects, no matter how you're building them. Uh, we took a more technical look at it today in React, but a lot of these concepts apply um, to various ways of building for the web. So I'm going to open it up for questions, and um, you can always um, hit up the DQ Systems Twitter and or my Twitter. We can help get your questions answered. So with that, I could probably turn some video on, maybe I don't know. But Laura, what do you want to? How do you want to handle this Q and A? Sure. If you want to turn on your video, that's fine. I can start shooting some questions at you, um, whatever you're comfortable with. The first one that we have coming your way um, asks, for error message, what would be the best method? Using ARIA live regions and role of alert or passing ARIA described by attribute when error messages are on the screen? So for forms, I guess we're talking about form errors. And one quick note is that I wasn't able to start my video. I'm not sure if it needs to be allowed by you. Um, so for form uh, error states, um, I haven't heard the greatest of things about native um, form validation. So I'm guessing you're talking about like if the user types something invalid or they don't fill in a form and you want to alert them that they need to go back to the form and make changes. Um, I am a big proponent of ARIA Live Regions. Um, so I do think that using some ARIA to mark up the error fields and then you know, tell the screen reader user what needs to be changed in a live region, I think that would be a perfectly fine um, technique to try. You'd want to make sure you tested it in all of the, the browsers that you support with their kind of well-known assistive technologies to make sure that that's actually working for the people who use it. Hopefully that answers your question. Great. Um, got another one here from Tessa. She, she asked, do you have any tips or pointers for creating uh, accessible image and text carousels in which controls are LI elements? And then she posted an example in the chat. Um, looks like it's pointing to a code pen IO. OK, I see it. So tips or pointers for creating accessible image and text carousels where the controls are LI elements. Well, first of all, LI elements are not focusable. So that is not a technically a control. You would have to put tab index and ARIA onto those. And then by doing that, you're really stomping over the native semantics of an LI. Um, I, even if you put tab index of zero on an LI, it's not an interactive element. Um, so when a screen reader user would land on that, it would, they'd be on a list item. So they wouldn't really know what to do with it. Um, carousels, that's a, that's a whole topic. <laughs> Accessibility folks, I think, are not huge fans of carousels. But if you're you know, doing your job and you, you need to add a carousel, um, I would advocate for putting an interactive control inside of that LI um, so that you're leaving the LI to be a, a member of a list and not trying to overload, um, not trying to overload it with um, interactive stuff. Um, looks like there's, yeah, there's probably some carousels in the web authoring practices uh, or the ARIA authoring practices guide. So I would definitely look there for patterns. Great, thanks. Um, we have some questions about Puppeteer and does, does it not work for KB testing and have you tried with Puppeteer? Puppeteer, um, so that is headless Chrome and um, that could certainly work. So it's really not Puppeteer that's the problem um, or even you know, whatever headless Chrome method you're using, even Phantom had its own problems. Um, and here we're talking about the rendering of like what you're testing against in your automated tests. Um, it's really about the framework you're using to write your tests, not necessarily where it's rendered. And Selenium WebDriver, they just, their bindings for 
keyboard support um, and, and click events, they behave more like what a real user's experience, like what actual HTML and JavaScript do. Um, so if you can get a, a test solution that will, will do what you want and you're not having to wrangle with the tool, then Puppeteer could work fine. Um, the challenge I have is that I really like asserting uh, keyboard support um, by firing a key down um, like event and most testing tools just don't work that way. Even the, the one that I thought might have been a solution was called Simulant. Uh, that's for unit testing and at least in React applications, they were not talking to each other. Um, Simulant was like not, I, I think the way that React um, event delegation happens, they have synthetic event and it's, it's delegated through your whole app so that if a view disappears, um, you don't get like a, a memory leak or something. So they, they delegate events through the whole application, which makes other testing tools trying to sniff around the outside. They don't fire events in the same way. So this is like a, a box of spiders, as I like to say. <laughs> it can be pretty challenging. So hopefully that kind of answers your question. I'd say Puppeteer is great. Uh, it's really the testing frameworks that you, you might be wrangling with. Perfect, thanks. Uh, um, another one here from Felipe, he asks, on the anchor tag that wraps around the SVG Twitter image, you use an ARIA label but no title attribute. Could you please explain your decision of using an ARIA label and no title attribute? Um, there's more than one way to deliver the, ex what's, this is what we call accessible name, and there's multiple candidates for accessible naming. Um, I believe title may have been added to that, um, that algorithm, so I probably could go use title. Um, I guess the, that would certainly work. Um, there's just more than one way to do it, and I chose ARIA label. Cool, thanks. Oh, this is a really good question. So do you have any tips on how to communicate the value uh, for, accessibility, for accessibility with non-technical stakeholders? Yeah, so there are lots of different stakeholders that may speak, you know, they speak a different persuasion language. Um, and for folks who are non-technical, I'd say even within that, there's different ways of trying to persuade people. Um, I had I got a similar question once of like, how would you convince your CFO? And I'm like, well, they're talking money. So you could talk about lost sales opportunities, especially with sales platforms or e-commerce. Um, you could point to the number of baby boomers that are aging and losing their eyesight or hearing. Um, so really talking about lost opportunity for um, customers and engagement. And I think even beyond just the financial sense that speaks to a lot of people um, about like, hey, you're shutting out your customers. Um, another way of kind of arguing for the case is that if you don't do it at all, the amount of technical debt that you get at the end is just, it becomes very uh, difficult to go and fix it all. So if you iterate on accessibility um, over time, um, you know, chip away at it with each sprint and each um, pull request, you can, you can add accessibility support um, and try to chip away at that technical debt because it can become very expensive and time intensive to try and fix it all after the fact. So yeah, there's lots of different ways um, that you can kind of position this argument and it really depends on like, I don't know, who you're trying to convince how you might tailor that argument. Cool, thanks Marcy. Um, another one here for you. Uh, what is the best approach for our for identifying, identifying form controls as required fields. Required indicator as a part of the label. Uh, yeah, it's, again, so many different ways to do things. Um, I personally will put like a, and an, yeah, make it part of the label. If I have multiple elements that are required, I'll like, put kind of a little key that says required at the top of the form and it'll like if I'm using an asterisk or something I'll like mark at the beginning of the form what that um, asterisk means by saying required. Um, you can mark it as required in HTML5. Uh, you could use aria required, it kind of depends on how you're marking that up but um, I definitely would spell out what like if you're marking it with an asterisk maybe even a red asterisk not just color but you know, there's a, a shape there and a color. Um, you want to decode whatever that, you know, 
whatever that asterisk means. So I usually do that once rather. I mean, if you're really being explicit, you could write out required in every single field. That might be a hard sell uh, sometimes. So personally, I like the key approach, um, but I'm sure there's other ways of doing it. Cool, thanks. Um, so have you had any success uh, with component libraries and accessibility in regards to development best practices? Uh, whew, man, mixed bag. Um, I've worked on one and I watched it degrade over time. So it's, a, <laughs> to be blunt, it's a little bit of a sore subject. Um, there's a lot of garbage out there. I'm going to be frank that most component libraries are not thinking about accessibility. There are some that are and some that are taking feedback, which is fantastic. So if you find a component library that you're like, okay, I looked into it a bit. It's got some accessibility problems. It really helps to open issues, um, to make them aware in a, in a nice way, as nice as possible. It's kind of emotional labor that we all have to do, but um, it really helps to spread awareness if you find stuff that isn't accessible. As for things that are accessible, um, we have a component library at DQ called the uh, Cauldron Pattern Library. Uh, we're always working on improving that because it's, it's a big job. Um, that's why I think devs and designers get, don't always get this right is that there's a lot of moving parts, um, a lot of places to support. I would say um, you can look at things like the ARIA authoring practices guide to get you know, components that are um, well thought of, uh, patterns that already exist. Um, Hayden Pickering's inclusive components is awesome. He tells you know, more than one way how to do something and he's just an all around expert and great person to follow. Um, so yeah, I'd say Hayden's stuff is probably the first place I would look, or DQ's pattern library. Um, I think even Bootstrap or Foundation, have, they've made a, a lot of progress, in, at least in some versions. Cool. Thanks for your response on that. So looks like we have time for a few more questions. Here's one for you. Is there a grid component that is, in your experience, has great accessibility support for complex use cases? such as nested and hierarchical grids? That I would have to look into more. Um, it's definitely a complex topic. Um, I think when you start really getting into, into those complex patterns, it's going to be difficult to have them work everywhere. Um, and especially since like for really large, you know, DOMs or large document object models, um, it, you, you end up rendering those virtually. So like a lazy load kind of thing where you're loading some at a time. And um, for those solutions, that's when ARIA tends to win because you can add things dynamically and it's kind of a for better or for worse situation. Um, like native HTML just might not render if it's that big of a list. So you have to do some kind of dynamic tricks to get that to work. Um, I haven't personally seen a good um, example of that, but hopefully someone else has, maybe in the comments, if you have seen something like that. Um, I see a note about Kendo UI. I would be impressed um, if I saw changes there, but the last time I checked, they were not doing a good job. Um, I, can I jump into a couple answers that I, I yeah, see? Yeah, please do. <laughs> First of all, it's DQ. It is not deck. <laughs> just, just, just make that sure. You can really think of it as uh, digital equality. Um, there's also a question about links and buttons. I have an article on my website, uh, links and buttons in modern web applications. You can check that out. The short answer is that links navigate the user. Buttons are um, just like interactive toggles. It's a pretty nuanced distinction. Um, Really, the way that we think about it is, uh, does the, you know, is it navigating the user somewhere? Is there routing involved? Um, and I've done some talks on that as well, so you can go check that out. Perfect. Thanks for jumping in. Yeah, if you see any that jump out to you, feel free to go for it. There got, were so many good questions. Yeah. I wish I could answer all of them. Yeah. Okay. Still have three more minutes, so I'm going to shoot some at you from the um, Q&A feature. Do you have any uh, color contrast tools for designers who might not be developers? Color contrast tools for designers. Yes, there's, there's a lot of really great tools. Um, well, the Axe extension has color contrast in it. Um, that assumes that you are already in a rendered web page. Um, I see a note about um, a tool for Sketch. 
There is that. Um, if you already, if you know the color values, like the hex values, maybe you're getting them from Illustrator or Photoshop. I like Leah Veru's contrast ratio um, interface on the web. Um, it, it sort of abbreviates or rounds up the values, at least last I checked. So it's good to use um, di different tools if you're really trying to figure out exactly what the, the color values are. Um, we round, I forget, I think we round up round down. I think actually we round down because if you have 4.45 to 1, it doesn't technically meet 4.5 to 1. So I'm pretty sure X-Core rounds down and I even made that change. <laughs> Can't keep it all in your head sometimes. Um, so you, to meet 4.5 to 1, you actually have to meet 4.5 to 1. Perfect. Um, so someone asked a question, I think in regards to your earlier um, form, demo he asked was it okay to make the first element inside a legend element be a h2 element instead of an h1 or plain text okay so question sounded like it was more about the heading level than okay. about being in a field set um so heading level really depends on the overall page hierarchy um so you want to look at kind of where it's being inserted into your greater document so you want to start with h1 and go in order at least up to H4, then you can jump around. Um, so if it's inside of a field set, um, I had an H2 in a legend. Um, so legend, I think that was a change they made a, a little while ago to allow headings to be put inside of a legend. Uh, not to be confused with, an, like a heading can't go in a label, <laughs> only in a legend or you know in raw HTML, like outside of those. Um, but it really depends on your overall page hierarchy. So that's what you'd want to look at. If you're writing a component library, maybe you want to make that heading level configurable. So depending on where it gets inserted, the developer could control the heading level. Um, if you can accomplish that with native heading tags rather than ARIA, that would be ideal. Cool. Okay, so it's two, but I'm going to throw one last question at you. Um, is, use, is utilizing ARIA described by on an input map to an element containing an error message a good approach to convey uh, validation errors? Sounds kind of like the question we had earlier, yeah. Um, which, yeah, I, I kind of off the top of my head, um, I did see one comment about live regions and only being announced the first time, which is true. Um, so probably an ARIA described by you want to make some sort of a mapping um, between the error message and the input. Um, hopefully I am holding this whole question in my head properly, but um, yeah, I would say probably that might be even another case for ARIA authoring practices. I'd, I'd have to go check if they have an error validation pattern, but I'm sure there's, there's examples out there that you could find. Um, really it's about making sure you have something that, that works for users. So Whatever you end up doing, I would test it with actual users with disabilities. <laughs> That's probably the, the, you know, we can recommend things all day long, but does it work for actual users is really the, the end goal. Perfect. And that really wraps back to the whole point of today's webinar, which is empathy-driven development and making sure that we're developing with users in mind. So I think that's a good point to end on. Um, thanks to everyone for your great questions. If we didn't get to you, I'll be sure to compile a list of questions to send to Marcy so she can get back to you. Um, feel free to always reach out to her on Twitter as well. And uh, final last reminder that this will be, uh, it has been recorded and we'll be sending that out in the next couple of days to everyone who registered for the webinar. So with that, we'll let you guys get back to your work day. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for coming everybody.